pension will get uh, started here. Yeah, so. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to this forum. Uh, my name is Pete Lackacher. I'm the president of the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our program committee, uh, Ann Raver, uh, Dorothy, Dick, and Susan Marcus. Thank you all very much for the good job you did pulling this together. We don't quite have all seats filled, but it looks pretty good. Uh, for those of you that came for the cake and didn't get it before the program, uh, there'll be cake. We hope there'll be cake left after the program. Uh, we're we're here today to acknowledge the 35th anniversary of of RIPS. Uh, there were uh, five incorporators of the organization. Uh, our speaker Lisa Gould was one of the five. Uh, the others were Irene Stuckey, Betty Solomon and Gil George, who have all passed away, and, and Marnie. Um, we've got a lot of new and ongoing efforts that, the, uh, that RIPS has undertaken. Uh, we had three very successful plant sales uh, this, during this past year. I think the only criticism was from the people who got there too late to buy plants, and we'll try and do better next year. Uh, we've got a new reseeding Rhode Island initiative, which you can read about in Wild Flora, which should come out in the next month or so. And then we've really got to focus on our communications. Uh, Wild Flora, which we do twice a, twice a year. We do the monthly e-news. Uh, and we formed a new digital uh, communications committee under the direction of Pat Foley, which uh, will try and pull all our communications together. Um, I want to thank uh, all the members who uh, have continued their membership and support the organization uh, and all the volunteers who uh, do everything that, that we do. Uh, we are always looking for members and we're always looking for volunteers. So if you uh, would like to join us and you're not a member, I believe there's some membership applications outside. And uh, if you'd like to volunteer, just speak up or raise your hand when somebody uh, somebody you know uh, who's involved with RIPS starts talking about it. Uh, finally, I'm going to acknowledge Brian Maynard, who's the uh, a longtime RIPS board member uh, and treasurer. And in his spare time, he's professor of plant science at URI. Uh, Brian's going to moderate the program this morning, uh, this afternoon, Brian. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Maynard, as, as Peter said, um, and I'm glad to be here. I'm just the guy that's reading the questions. So um, the way this is going to work is that we have um, we're going to have Lisa get up and talk to us a little bit about the history of the organization, which I think is uh, uh, appropriate given the occasion. Um, and then after she's done, um, there's a series of three questions that we have that we have worked with the panelists on. And I will read the questions and then the panelists will pass a microphone around and give their two cents or 10 cents on the topic. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And because of the time, because we do want to keep this brief, beautiful day out there now, um, we were going to try to limit it to about five or six questions at the most between each section, and then perhaps we'll have more time for questions at the end, depending what time it is. Um, so I won't waste any more of your time. I just want to introduce the panelists. We have Lisa Gould um, on your uh, left, who is one of the co-founders of the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society uh, back in 1986, I think it was. Yeah, 1986, and is now a resident of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, and then we have in the center, Uli Larimer, who uh, I found out is a native Delawarean and graduate of the same high school as me, go Bulldogs. And, uh, and he is, uh, uh, he's the director of horticulture for the Native Plant Trust with responsibility for both Garden in the Woods and the Masami uh, uh, project. And then on your right, we have Heather McCargo, who is the founder of the Wild Seed Project. I think I have that right in Portland, Maine. Um, and so please welcome our panelists right now. Well, 
Okay, so the question for Lisa is, please describe the situation that led you and others to start RIPS, and likely, likely the reasons at the time did not include climate change in Rhode Island, or did it, question mark, uh, but what, what were the group's concerns about the survival of, woody, of wild plants at the time, and how did RIPS founders view the problems of that time? And also, what are some of the activities that RIPS undertook in their first years? So welcome, Lisa. <coughs> Good afternoon. It's great to see you all today. Wonderful. Well, the Wild Plant Society had its beginnings in 1986 when a group of us got together in the cookhouse at the Epley Wildlife Refuge, which is a wonderful old building if you've ever been there, um, to talk about wild plant cultivation. And during that informal meeting, I told the group about the Wildflower Garden Club that my mother belonged to in North Carolina. And this was a wonderful group of women. Sorry, it was all women then. Later, it did integrate and include men. Um, but it was a group of women, many of whom loved to grow native plants and all of them who loved to traipse around in the wild. So they were marvelous. I used to hike with them when I was a teenager. Uh, as we talked, we agreed that it'd be wonderful to have a group like that in North Carolina, and, and sorry, I'm gonna mix my states up here, in Rhode Island, um, a group dedicated to wild plants and also to study them both in our yards and in the wild. But we quickly agreed that we didn't want a garden club. We wanted something with a broader focus. Um, we wanted to go beyond gardening, beyond having fun together, although we wanted to do both of those things, but we wanted an organization that had a big, educational and conservation um, components to it. So that's how we got started. It was Betty Solomon and I who led the charge, but many people were in the brigade. And uh, we talked to like-minded friends and told people about what we were doing. And within a year, in 1987, we were a fully incorporated organization. We had um, a board of directors, we paid dues, we had bylaws drawn up by your own Peter Lockature. We did that. Um, and within a few months of that incorporation, we already boasted 150 memberships. So we grew quickly, um, and people were very excited about the Wild Plant Society. Now, I would love to be able to name everybody who worked so hard during those early years. There's so many dedicated people. But if I did that, we'd be here all day, and Brian would have to get his shepherd's hook out and pull me off the stage. So the people I'm going to mention are our first board of directors because some of them are still with us today. And so our first board, and many of them unfortunately are not, our first board was myself as president, Betty Solomon as vice president, Nancy Magandance as recording secretary, Martha Marshall was um, corresponding secretary, and Marnie Lockatur was our treasurer. It was her favorite post, as I recall. Um, then our members at large were Edith Calderera, Rick Enser, Gilbert George, Roger Goose, Millie House, Kathleen Kinsey, Helen Lucy, who I think is here today. Yes, Helen's here today. Um, Margaret Johnny Stone, Irene Stuckey, and Dorothy Swift, who's been with us all these years also. So that was our first board. We worked real hard to put together a board of people which represented a broad range of interests and backgrounds. So we didn't want all academicians, we didn't want all gardeners, we, we wanted a broad range of people. Basically, I think RIPS was formed around a shared love of wild plants and specifically a love of being outside with our native plants in their natural communities, our plants in context. And that led us to want to go beyond being a garden club and to want to reach out to the wider community with education and conservation interests. And to me, the great success of this society has been that we've appealed to a broad range of people with all kinds of activities. And I think that's why it has done so well over these 35 years. Now, within the first five or six years of our existence, we were offering 50 to 60 events every year, including walks, plant sales, cultivation workshops, lectures, garden tours, and identification classes. The seed starters, the first seed starters group started in those first few years. We inventoried properties for townships and conservation organizations, and that was very valuable data about our state's natural communities. We published newsletters, cultivation notes, fun pages for children, um, and informational handouts. 
We created libraries displays, plant identification boards, live, um, plant, um, what was it, the plant discovery boxes were put together to inform and entertain school children. We sponsored prizes at the State Science Fair for students who were doing things with wild plants. And we started getting scholarships. They were small, but we started getting scholarships to college students who were studying native plants. And we also sponsored, we included, or worked to include and succeeded getting sea lavender protected under the Christmas Greens law. So that was an early effort too. And in those first five or six years, I believe, we were making plans to create the first, our first display at the Rhode Island Spring Flower and Garden Show. And as many of you know, those displays won many, many prizes over the years. Um, so Kay Kinsey put it well, our activities, education and agitation. <laughs> well, what motivated us to do that? In preparation for our 10th anniversary celebration, I actually did a random survey of members, like, why the heck are you in this group? Why are, what are you here for? A major theme, of course, was development. People were very concerned as they saw the loss of, the loss of our forests and fields to housing developments and malls and roads. And also then the subsequent loss of the plants and animals that live in our forests and woodlands and, and, hedge, and hedge rows and fields. There was grief over the loss of specific plants. I remember people mentioning bottle gentians and lady slippers and not seeing as many Turks cap lilies. So there was grief about that too. And other people, and also grief over not being able to walk over wild lands as much as you used to be able to. As the land got carved up and more private ownership, there was less opportunity to just go exploring in places you wanted to explore. And of course, um, people mentioned invasive plants overwhelming our native vegetation. In general, people felt sadness for this loss and frustration and the powerless to do anything about it. 125 years before that, W. Whitman Bailey wrote, he, uh, he's the author of Among Rhode Island Wildflowers, and he wrote, now in view of the inevitable encroachment of streets and houses, we are silent while the heart is aching. It is hard to see what nature made so beautiful, debased and ruined. More importantly, people were motivated by a love of place. Rhode Island may not have the flora of the Midwestern prairies or the Great Smoky Mountains, but I think it's the small nature, the small scale in itself creates a kind of intimacy, a love of place with the full realization that we don't have a lot of it and we need to treasure every, every bit of it. And people love, part of the love of that is greeting, greeting our plant friends who doesn't love to see the first trailing arbutus of spring. Or maybe you get to go out and meet a new friend, maybe like bastard toad flax or something. So flower rising was what Ken and Betty Weber called and probably everybody in this room loves to flowerize. What other small state has as many land trusts as Rhode Island? And also a very active Audubon Society and Nature Conservancy chapter, yeah, and Nature Conservancy chapter, which are major conservation landowners in the state. Where I live in North Carolina, the county I live in, along with the county to my immediate east, those two counties are about the same size as Rhode Island in terms of square miles. Those two counties, plus seven other counties in the northwestern Piedmont of North Carolina, are under the aegis of one land conservancy, the Piedmont Land Conservancy. It's a great group. Rhode Island has 45 land trusts and conservancies. That's astounding. When I tell people in North Carolina that the Piedmont Land Trust is great, but we had 45 of these groups in, in Rhode Island in this tiny little state. So I think that's really kudos to Rhode Island for that. Well, RIPS members were also made it, motivated simply by the delight of being with people who had a common passion and want to spread that pleasure around. That's one of the things we love to do. Many of us have stories about what got us interested in childhood, interested in wild plants as children. Or maybe it was an adult friend who shared their excitement and passed the contagion along. So there are lots of ways we can get excited about wild, wild plants. And yes, we were aware of climate change. 
in 1988, the year after the Wild Plant Society formed, I was sent to attend a conference sponsored by the World Wildlife Fund in Washington, D.C. The title of the conference was Consequences of the Greenhouse Effect for Biological Diversity. It was attended by over 300 people from all over the world. Um, I think there's one of your board members here has worked at the World Bank, or well, the World Bank was there. Um, conservation agencies, botanical gardens, zoos, federal, state, local agencies, um, and many academic institutions were represented there. So it was a big conference. And kudos to RIPS, by the way, we were the only state plant society represented there. Good for you. Um, I should note that virtually everything, the, the scientists, the climatologists and ecologists who presented at that conference, virtually everything they said was going to happen, they predicted has or is coming to pass. More frequent storms, droughts, wildfire, wildfires, floods, sea level rise, permafrost collapsing, the movement of tropical diseases into temperate zones, the whole panoply there. And of course, the concern that our plant and animals communities could not evolve quickly enough in the face of all this extraordinarily rapid change. So yes, climate change was on our mind. Um, we did a redux of the original article I wrote about that in the winter of 2018 while Flora, Rhode Island. So if you want to read more about that conference, um, I imagine it's on the website, though that wild floor is on the website. So I'm grateful to participate today because this is, like I said, this has been on our mind for 35 years. And finally, I just want to say how wonderful it is to, to be with so many friends today and new faces too, that's great, and to come in all of you for the amazing work you've been doing over these last four decades. It's pretty incredible. Whether you've served on the board, you've maybe led walks, you've created garden club displays, you've sown seeds or collected seeds and tended plants for the sales. Goodness, you've talked to garden clubs, you've created websites and blogs. What else have you done? You've inventoried properties. You've done so much, created native landscapes in your yard, or maybe you've simply enjoyed attending some of the activities of the Wild Plant Society. Whatever you've done, you deserve great credit. So kudos to you all and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, okay, so first question. Um, there's a growing public interest in doing something <laughs> positive for the environment coupled with uncertainty and anxiety about what the future holds in the face of climate change. Seeding initiatives, pollinator pathways, and public gardens that demonstrate the key role of native plants for wildlife are timely projects. But there are many other projects that might better demonstrate the importance of native wild plants given the changes expected due to global warming, which include warmer winters, flooding, more pests, drought, et cetera. Who should RIPS consider partnering with to create such projects and to educate and inspire a wider audience? And I'm going to hand the microphone to Heather first, and then we'll work our way back down, give, um, give Lisa an opportunity to catch her breath. As soon as this starts working. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you for having me. And I am a propagator, a seed propagator. And when I founded Wild Seed Project eight years ago, I felt like that was the missing link with all this getting native plants into the landscape is we need more people knowing how to sow the seeds and get the plants growing because that's how you're making new plants. It's great to have a nursery that you can go buy them from, but wanting to create a grassroots movement to get more people sowing the native seeds. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wild Seed Project, but we you know, get people to sow the seeds in pots outside in the late fall so that they go through the winter outside and then they germinate in the spring. And ideally you wait and plant them in the landscape the next fall, you grow them in your little native nursery over the summer. And so, getting people to not be afraid to sow the seeds, I think is really critical 
And it's a really inexpensive way to get a lot of the plants out in the landscape. The other areas that I think we need a lot more of with native plant organizations is policy. You know, we need to get political and get some policy with our state and federal government to protect more land and, you know, do the things that we'd like to see the change happen in the landscape that we'd like to see. Um, the other piece that I think is really sometimes missing in the native plant nursery world is recognizing the pretty nasty chemicals that are used in a lot of the nursery trade these days and growing these plants without, you know, organically. So it's not just not using pesticides. It's also needing to have good, you know, organic soil that's got live, you know, compost in it. So it's got live creatures in it. And then the landscape and gardening practices that support the life in the soil. And with the time of year we are now leaving the leaves, not raking them all away and shipping them off to your even compost center, keeping them in your yard, because that's how, you know, in nature, that's how nutrients are recycled and getting more people to do that. Uh, I'd uh, also like to offer my thanks for being here today. Thank you. Um, to build off what Heather said, I think that the, there are there's a, a number of different um, approaches that I think are necessary. I'm, I'm going to start with um, the importance of communication and messaging. And as you've mentioned, there's this real desire to do something good or positive. And I think a lot of this is motivated by a sense of anxiety about what the future holds because we don't really know. Um, and so uh, uh, as I've been involved in native plant advocacy for a long time, I've kind of come around to really understanding the power of a welcoming positive message in that um, we have serious challenges to face uh, from, you know, the maintenance practices that are very much ingrained, not only in homeowners, but in the companies that people hire to clean up and tidy their yards, um, to the way in which plants are propagated on an industrial scale mm -hmm. and how that does not favor genetic diversity or known provenance or even knowing where plants come from. Um, but I don't think you're going to win very many friends by garden shaming and telling them that you are doing it wrong. Um, I also think it's really important for native plant industry sort of as a, as a whole to um, present themselves as, you know, we're not inherently anti-ornamental -ornament, uh, and, it, and it's not, we're not trying to, to kind of other the rest of the horticulture industry and say, you know, what you're doing is inherently bad because of all these other reasons. I think it's much more fruitful to uh, to encourage and, and, and uh, um, welcome some of these plants into your gardens and recognize that while there is a sense of urgency, we're still bound to a temporal scale of plants. In other words, you can only plant so many things every year and it takes that season after season to attract the wildlife that we want to see and that it's a slow process. And somewhere in, in between the, the sense of urgency that we want to take action now and allowing for these things to develop on their own is there's a compromise in there. Um, and so uh, the messaging is incredibly important. Uh, I also think that uh, the the future uh, of land stewardship and uh, ecological uh, uh, actually ecologically minded horticulturalists are in high schools and colleges now, and we need to do a better job of reaching and, and exciting those uh, the, those demographics. They are they've grown up with climate change. They are very much aware of what is happening, and there's a great desire to to do something about it. But there's also a sense of maybe, you know, gatekeeping by the, the, the elders of the, of the industry that says, well, you can only do it this way. And I think, again, there's a lost opportunity there to harness that excitement and engagement. Um, and it's everything from encouraging, for example, more ecological field studies in landscape architecture programs, um, trying to bring and center ecology back into horticultural programs. And 
Some academic universities do this really, really well. Others are still stuck decades behind uh, and are churning out people who are responsible for designing built landscapes without that kind of uh, um, ethos in mind. Um, so uh, again, for me, the, the importance of the communication, the messaging is central throughout all of these different groups. And, um, and I say this a lot as someone who has spoken at umpteen native plant conferences, it almost feels like a little bubble world and that we need to figure a way to broaden the message a little bit out from you know, uh, a group of the already converted. Um, I think that's the challenge in moving forward and in, in finding ways to to break into these different groups or, or uh, engage different audiences. Pragmatically, of course, no one organization can do it all themselves. So partnering with other like-minded organizations uh, and being strategic about it, I think, is the best way forward. Um, and I'll turn it over to Lisa. And I'll echo some of what Uli has to say. Uh, continuing to work with the RIDEM, the Audubon Society, the Nature Conservancy to create buffers around existing preserves and to increase connectivity as much as we can is very, very important. So all we can do to work, to work together is great. And that working together also includes DOT and the landscape nursery and landscape industry, landscape architects, and you know, the Uli was sending a positive message, showing people how beautiful native plants are and how well they grow. Um, I don't know if the Wild Plant Society has a habitat certification program. Um, I, had, I looked on the website and didn't see it. That is something we do in the North Carolina Native Plant Society. Um, the homeowners fill out a form talking about what are the native plants in their yard, what invasives have they gotten rid of, um, what, is, what is the habitat in their yard, and if you qualify, which almost everybody who applies does, there's a lovely yard sign you can have in your yard. You can show your neighbors that and say, you know, this is a beautiful habitat. Um, and here you can be part of that too. So I don't know if that's something you might want to consider. Um, there's a bigger context, of course, than, than us with climate change. All kinds of groups are being affected. The timber industry is being affected. Here in Rhode Island, shell fishermen, fishermen. Um, those are all gonna be affected by climate change. I don't know what we might be able to do to work with people like that, but I, I know the Rhode Island Natural History Survey is doing some salt marsh research work. There's an interest in Chesapeake Bay in restoring salt marshes as they are inundated and move more inland. Um, there's some interesting work going on on the East Coast on that, and I don't know if y'all are into any of that or not, but um, I think that might be a wonderful intersection of looking at the broader community we're with um, and thinking about their concerns as well, which will certainly reflect well on the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society. Um, Doug Tallamy put it well in, in terms of the, both the certification program and, and the broader community. We need to have functioning ecosystems everywhere, not just in parks and preserves. We've got to exist with nature where we live. Um, and I think he's, he's hit the nail on the head with that one. So, Okay, why don't you hold on to that for now? So we're going to uh, have a brief a few questions here. And Nikki Hagen in the back, a board member, is going to stand up. And if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and she'll come to you. And remember to speak directly into the mic like you're on a singing competition. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm on the board of Audubon oh, and I'm, is used, it on? I'm closer. Yeah, yep. I'm, I'm on the board of, at Audubon and I used to work for TNC. So I, I know this landscape of land trusts a little bit. And I can say that one of the trouble of having so many land trusts is that when you go to be politically active and you go to the state house, they don't listen to 57 people. They will only listen to us if we glom together and make a partnership and come as one voice. And I would really like to learn how to do that. If you have any thoughts. <laughs> okay, so just to repeat the question, um, with so many different land trusts, one possible uh, negative of that is not being able to have impact at the right level for effective change. So do you want to address that, Uli? 
Uh, just to say, I think in Massachusetts there is a there's like a coalition of land trust group because uh, uh, Massachusetts I think boasts over 250 land trusts, um, which you know, it's a larger state, of course, but also has a lot of the smaller entities and um, building one uh, sort of coalition of those land groups can uh, help consolidate voices and and carry the weight of the collective land trust community uh, when it comes to speaking to policymakers. Um, and again, I don't know if that exists in Rhode Island or not, or if they're, you know, again, it, it, we were talking about this earlier, it does all in some ways boil down to having the right people in place to be able to pull this all together and their connections. Um, but that's uh, one suggestion I think that could be. Uh, does anybody else want to address that? Yeah. Okay. okay, that was a good enough answer. Okay, next question. Yes, over there, Nikki. Thank you. Just to follow up, there's a group called the Land Trust Alliance, and they're, uh, they're a good place for you to start. Um, you can do landtrustalliance.org. Okay. okay, thank you. So we do have the Land Trust Alliance. Also, um, exploreri.org is a wonderful website that conducts the land trusts in terms of uh, walk maps and trail maps and things of that sort. Explore our eye. Um, so we have a question, um, Kyra, in the back. Hi, just one more clarification. We have the Rhode Island Land Trust Council that is the overarching kind of coordinating group for all of the land trusts. And that would be uh, Kate Sales, who's the director there. Okay, we had a question down here. Um, there was somebody over here first. Okay, um, we have Ann Raver down here. Well, this is along the same lines. Um, you know, Uli mentioned uh, that their audience of eager people is high schools and colleges. Well, I think we need like to get an idea of how to approach those organizations. Like, do you try to go and give a talk? Do you like, do you contact their, you know, ecological teacher? I found it's really hard to um, get an inroad in just my little local school. So if you, any ideas on actually how you break into those groups would be great. I don't, I don't know if the society has a speakers bureau, does it? Um, yeah, we used to, and I, I know we do in North Carolina. And that's on our website of what people want to speak about and can the groups they'll speak to. And if you advertise that, send it out to the schools, then that might be a good way to make contact. Let schools know you exist and you have people willing to, to share your passion. So I have a 20 year old daughter and a 25 year old son in the summer. They both had an internship at the historical group in Portland and they were researching the Asian American community in Portland. And then the organization was talking about what are we gonna do with this information when we're done? Maybe we should have a lecture series. And my daughter is 20 is like, that was like not how to reach her age group, you know, and she and she's done some you know, multimedia classes at Brandeis University where she goes and, you know, for the, so little, short, fun videos, you know, they, there's a, even though she goes to college and likes to hear lectures, when you say how to make it fun and capture their attention, it really is this whole other world that, do you know, I don't know about, but I, her reaction was so strong when she heard the word lectures. I'm like, oh, I want to go hear that. She was like, ah. you know? um, okay, so, so we're going to have Pat work on TikTok. The rich TikTok <laughs> dance for this. Well, which was to say that I read an article recently about how um, the younger generation isn't interested in what we think of as clubs in societies in terms of you know, meeting in the same place, paying dues and so forth, and that um, uh, across these various social media platforms, there are 
groups that share similar interests and, in, you know, and the way that they talk about it, and, you know, if you use Instagram, for example, what they use to choose to identify their posts with hashtags, nowhere in the, any of that does the word garden club show up. <laughs> so that should tell you something. And I also think that, you know, uh, uh, we ought to ask them directly instead of assuming like we know what they want to engage them, find out from them, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, children of members here or grandchildren or whatever, uh, um, find out ways in which they, like what gets them excited uh, and, and start asking it that way. Um, because I do think that the, you know, the, the model of, yes, like, you know, I like going to lectures and that's exciting for me, but it's not for the next generation. It's just not how they get excited. Um, and you could certainly criticize that, that, you know, short fun videos lack depth and, and, and you can't really get at complex issues in, you know, a 20 second video. Um, that may be our perception of it. Uh, and maybe they follow up on their own in some other separate way, um, to, to dive deeper into this. Um, but I, I feel like this model is not what the next generation wants. And, and in order for us to remain viable uh, with that next generation, that demographic, we also have to be flexible and we shift the way in which we tra transmit our information. Okay, that was excellent. Did you want to address that, Lisa? Native, native plant gardening on Minecraft. <laughs> that would appeal to my eight-year-old granddaughter who was just here. Um, one more question uh, down front. Here, Jordan. Hi, Francis Tommy. I'm taking a different tack. I'm on a planning commission for the town of Charlestown. And when we have an application for a, a commercial or a subdivision to come in, and they have to put in some landscaping. And I push really hard for them to put in native plants. They often refer to the URI uh, sustainable plant book, although there's a few in there I have questionable. But if there are other people who have towns that have planning commissions, um, pay attention, maybe talk to some of them, try and introduce the idea to them that they push for native plants in the landscaping that these developments are in, because otherwise they just put the standard stuff and you've got calorie pear everywhere and you've got, you know, burning bush or something else. Um, you can make a difference by pushing a bit to get them to plant native plants. And some of them are willing, some of the landscapers that they employ are knowledgeable, but there's an awful lot that don't really care. So every town has a planning commission or planning board, and they make those decisions. So support anybody on that that welcomes native plants. Uh, do you folks have any experience with planning commissions and Uli? Uh, not directly planning commissions, but uh, one of my staff members was involved in the successful uh, passing of a native plant ordinance in the city of Somerville. Uh, in Massachusetts, um, and it was a you know multi-year effort to work with the city to uh, ensure um, that I think the the ordinance uh, mandates seventy-five percent of any plant material going into public spaces has to be native plant. Now, uh, an interesting caveat to that is that um, some folks found ways around that, and what they did was they bought three quarters of the plants native really small, and then the remaining 25 very large. And so you go into this public park that was supposed to be three quarters native, and there's a bunch of tiny little plants that fulfills the requirement, and then like large B and B trees and shrubs and things that went in that. So I, one of those like learn from your mistakes and maybe you would have uh, written the ordinance a little bit differently. Um, to, to, but but it, it does show that it's possible to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, just to move it on, if you did not get your question asked, please hold it till the end. Okay, the second question for the panel. Uh, increasingly, Rhode Island Wild Plant Society projects like Reseeding Rhode Island and the RIPS Seed Starters and Plant Sale are focusing on using only Eco Region 59 native germplasm. Considering the likely effects of climate change in Rhode Island, along with so many pest and invasive plant issues, we fear that certain native plants and their pollinators may not survive. Do these threats call for more collaborations outside of Rhode Island and perhaps even outside of Eco Region 59? 
Should we be combining our resources and projects, even including seed collecting, with others within RICO Region 59? And should we be thinking more in terms of bioproportionality, which is the concept of encouraging optimal populations of species within an ecosystem, being, flex being flexible with the definition of native, how long does a human introduced native uh, from further south need to survive on its own in New England in order to be considered part of our flora, and uh, assisted migration of rare and endangered plants uh, and the like. So Uli, why don't you start and then pass it to Lisa, and or, and or actually let's start with Lisa and we'll go down that way. It'll be easier. Okay. That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, a lot yeah. of questions, and we could spend all day on that one. Um, so, <laughs> um, talking about maybe expanding to more southern species, I think that has certainly some some things to think about. But I'm very aware of how many mistakes we made, particularly introducing non-natives that were great for wildlife, for example, in the past. Um, so mistakes could be made. Um, but I have thought about some of the plants that are at the northern limits of our range here. Yellow poplar, for example, makes it into Massachusetts, but not a whole lot farther. Um, it does grow here in Rhode Island. So that might be one we can consider is already a native here. Um, but what about sourwood? Um, that's another one. It makes it to New York State. Um, red bud, yep. Um, so those ones might be some that we could consider. Um, consider planting. And then there's some natives that have naturalized here, and I'm thinking about um, umbrella tree, magnolia tripetala, which has escaped a little bit from cultivation here. Um, and I'm curious to know what's the insect life and, and community around the magnolia tripetala we have here, the umbrella tree we have here, compared to where it's native starting from Pennsylvania south. That would be an interesting research project biologists are talking about something called interaction diversity. It's a step different from just ordinary biological diversity. It's the idea that you look at all the organisms that a plant has evolved with, the, the invertebrates, the, the fungi, the protozoans, and how does that community work together? And ecologists are beginning to see that as even more important than just diversity that we used to look at. All those interactions create a real richness so I'd be interested if once we start thinking about moving out of our eco region and bringing plants up from farther south, how does the interaction diversity differ if, if we can study that in some way? So that's that's one thing thought to start with. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think that the the definition of native needs to be flexible, particularly in in, in the face of climate change. And, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Brian brought up the a uh, question of, of maybe you could call neo-natives or things that are uh, um, native further south but have been introduced by humans in, into gardens and then have escaped. Um, and I think of you know traditional definitions of flora um, uh, as, as things that existed before Europeans got here, um, sort of discount the activity of the humans that were here already in terms of moving plants around and humans have forever moved plants around. And so I think that our definition of native also needs to be able to shift to accommodate for human activities into the future. Um, and certainly, you know, if you look at the floor of the Northeast is now uh, um, 6,000 species, let's say, of which uh, a, a third of them are introduced. Um, and so, yes, the flora has grown in terms of numbers of of individual different kinds of things, but a third of them were never here before, but thanks to humans and global trade and so forth, they are here now. Um, so the the other question that, uh, and we had this discussion a little bit briefly over uh, over lunch today, um, is the, the need for uh, science to kind of catch up with, uh, with what's happening in practice. Um, and what I'm speaking about here is that the, the idea of, of choosing things that are only within an ecoregion uh, is underpinned by the idea that, there's, that there is a, a genetic uniqueness or an ecotype that is best adapted for this condition, which is why you want to source plants that will grow best here. And that is undoubtedly true for some plants, but it turns out it isn't necessarily true for all plants. And I have a, a, an intriguing example to offer, which is 
um, the thesis work from uh, one of our research botanists uh, who looked at um, genetic diversity of common milkweed versus genetic diversity of swamp milkweed across a broad geographic range in the Midwest. And her results show that um, there was very little genetic diversity across broad geographic range, so multiple ecoregions for common milkweed. So a plant that you find all over the place that is more or less the same, the same degree of diversity across the landscape, whereas swamp milkweed was very much, its diversity was unique and tied to specific geographic locations. So what this means, it has implications to say that if you were sourcing uh, uh, for a restoration project and it calls for common milkweed, that it might not really matter where the seed comes from because there's a general baseline of diversity across a region. Whereas other species, it's actually really important that you source locally because you're trying to capture those local adaptations. The problem is that as the data is lacking, we are left with uh, approaching this problem with you know, the uh, concept of best practices or a, a conservative approach, which is to say, source as locally as possible because we don't really know. And so I think there's still a lot of, you know, we want to be informed by best practices and by science, but they need to catch up quite a bit. And then it brings into other questions of, you know, funding for these sorts of researches and so forth. Um, but we don't have all the answers. And so we have to, we have to go by, you know, uh, the conservative approach. So um, I'll leave it at that. And toss it over. Well, of course, we want to boost the population of all our remaining local wild plants. And one thing that would be really interesting to me to see for this organization is how much wild, you know, how much development has changed since you founded the organization, like a visual graphic so people can see how much wild land has been lost and why our populations are shrinking. So of course, you know, a local group can focus a lot on its local plants and let's propagate more of them. However, my background in forest ecology and I've studied a lot of paleo botany and, you know, the, if there's anything we know is that when the climate change, plants and animals and all the creatures are on the move. And we've had, you know, not just with the last two and a half million years with the ice ages where the plants have moved north and south many times. Um, it, you know, five million years ago was a lot hotter than it is now. And then I think it was 56 million years ago. Um, it's called the something glacial no, the anyways the, it was we are headed for that climate that we had 56 million years ago and luckily our plants have moved back and forth or many of them haven't have in the past and they will reassemble themselves and same with the insects and animals so i think uh, you know and this is one thing i find interesting with young people and a lot of young scientists too are much more proactive on wanting to you know participate in assistant migration because, you know, look at the weather today. You know, we've had a couple of weeks of beautiful, but eerie weather. This is, things are changing before our eyes. And are we gonna just keep being conservative? Or are we gonna be a little bit more, you know, what I'd like to see is not have so many exotic plants everywhere because they won't have those interactions to all the other life for, you know, we don't know how long, a couple hundred to thousands of years. So I'd much rather see some more southerly plants, you know, be included here. But as a local organization, we all should be working to getting more, making more of our local gene pool too. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, questions. Do we have a question down front here? Make Nikki run. <laughs> the big push for people to choose plants the last couple of years has been pollinator gardens. And I think that there's been a very narrow definition of pollinators. In my garden, it seems like the pollinators everybody wants are butterflies and they'll go anywhere. But they 
caterpillars don't. And the, the things that you think are virus bugs that lead to the other pollinators. And I, one of the places I think that the education needs to change is just by definition of what we want. Like pollinator, I mean, I want lots of butterflies too, but. Okay, so should we change the definition of pollinator? Do we want to start that? I think it could be broader. Broaden, broaden the definition. I think we need to talk about host plants for these. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the flower and the bee and the butterfly, even though they are accessible entry points into this whole discussion. But we also need to emphasize that um, certain insects have, um, I like to say, dietary restrictions. Okay, <laughs> They can only survive eating a certain kind of plant. And so if you want to see the spice bush swallowtail, if you want to see the monarch, you have to give them the food that the caterpillars need to eat. Even if the spice bush swallowtail doesn't interact with the flowers of spice bush at all, the two are intimately bound together. And so that is part of part of the overall argument that it's, it, you know, pollinators are great, but it's, it's one part of a much bigger picture. I think Heather wanted it next. I think the word pollinator is a good entry level word for people who are not paying attention a lot. And I get requests all the time, give a talk on native pollinator plants. I'm like, every native plant is a pollinator plant for just those reasons you need it as a host plant. So I think it's an effective word for certain audiences. But so then how do you get the next level of information in there really simply to get them realizing more is the challenge. And I will give the monarch butterfly credit for making regular people like they've gotten the message that it needs milkweed, you know, as its host plant. And then I like to say, but that's true of all of our insects need a host plant. So I, I'm not against those simple words because some people, it, do, it does capture the general audience. It's like, how do you though, take it a little bit farther and not just end at that? Because if it was just a pollinator garden that the host plants didn't matter, then it could be, a lot of exotic plants that have nectar. Okay, next question. Anyone um, over here? Uh, Nikki? Or I, I don't have a question. I just have to ask oh. something really exciting. Well, I'll use the microphone so everybody can hear it. Hi. This summer, I was asked to come to the science coach of Portsmouth's field and it's right down from the Portsmouth Middle School and they have this humongous field they have chickens they've had the field plowed they grow all kinds of vegetables um, so they called they were like I grew all the pumpkins for them and then I called the tree company so we had Talk them all the so we had the mulch but then she asked me to meet with the um, land trust conservationist. And the middle school has had a huge grant through the Wild Plant Society, I believe. And uh, so she would like me to, I'm gonna plant all the Asclepia incarnata, you know, all the natives for the middle school. But anyway, it goes to you, Anne, because this woman is on fire you know, for, for, for kids learning about plants and they've got tractors and the kids run the tractors and it's just really, really exciting. And I'm so blessed that it's in my town. So I think it's out there. We have to get to the kids. It's actually almost better for the third question in our panel. Um, do we have one more question just for the sake of time? We need to keep it short. Okay, I'll move to the next question. So, um, I'd like to boil this down, but I probably shouldn't. I should probably just read what's in front of me. Okay, so question three. Uh, ben Rollins, in a new book entitled The Tree Line, The Last Forest and the Future of Life on Earth, uh, St. Martin's Press 2022, writes that the last generation to know a stable climate with seasonal cycles and familiar species and all the human culture and traditions that rest on that foundation has already been born. 
accepting that there is no return to normal um, is also the door to action. So how do you, our panelists, think that people born without the familiarity of predictable seasonal cycles, that's really sad to even read that. I hope that's not really true. Um, and the traditions upon which they rest will interpret the challenge. For instance, will the growing attention on the human causes of climate change encourage them to look critically at the ways in which their elders, us, defined our relationship to nature? And do you see new trends in their understanding or areas of interest? And I think Uli started to address this uh, in answering the first question. Um, even if we can't predict the specifics of their evolving lines of thinking, how do we benefit from and remain relevant to the new perspectives of this next generation? So why don't you start, Lisa? I would certainly hope that the next generation will look critically at what we've done. Um, that's important. I remember in the late 1950s that my Girl Scout leader, also happened to be my mother, um, <laughs> touted the value of bicolored Lespedeza, which now we consider an invasive species. It's a non-native. But it was great for erosion control and great for wildlife. But the definition of wildlife at that time tended to be songbirds and game birds and animals. We've now, as we've been discussing, stretched that idea of wildlife to include that whole community that evolved with plants and you know animals of all sorts, protozoans, fungi, everything. Um, so we, we have begun to make those changes and this next generation will make, make that change even more. Um, but I, I do think we, it's good to look back and listen to some of the older voices who did have many words of wisdom. Um, one of them would be Edward Abbey who wrote, growth for the sake of growth, is the ideology of the cancer cell. <laughs> and our culture is built on more and more growth, more and more stuff. Um, and here's where I think it's wonderful that there's a newer focus at last on the wisdom of indigenous people who have been aware of more balance for a long time. So I'd start. You're here. That, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the, you know, the engagement with the next generation is incredibly important, getting them excited about what is here now, rather than, um, you know, a, a sense of grief about what was lost. Because um, the next generation, I have, I have two young boys, you know, two and five years old, they don't know what 20 years looked like, but they will know what they, their landscape looks like moving forward. And so all that we can do to ensure that it is functioning and as wild as possible um, will allows them to inherit that and become entranced and, and bewitched and, and, and intrigued by it and carry that sense of wanting to preserve it forward. Um, and it, it, it's a pragmatic approach, you know, because it, when, when Heather was talking about um, you know, the, the uncertainty of climate change and assisted migration. And I think we have to accept that there are going to be winners and losers in this process. And it's sad to say goodbye to things like Turks cap lily that are, you know, thanks to the deer and among other things are becoming increasingly rare and rare. Um, and so if you, you know, it makes me cherish the ones that we have even more. Um, and it's sad to, you know, sit there and be like, I'm watching this thing blink out. And maybe that's what motivates this next generation's to, you know, desire to take action instead of, uh, instead of sitting back and watching. Um, but I, I, again, I feel like we can't come from a place of grief. We can't, can't come from a place of sadness. Isn't going to, that's not what I want to leave behind uh, for my children. Um, and so, to celebrate what we have and to still have hope, really what it boils down to, um, for me is the only way forward. Well, and we have a lot of the solutions in hand to change this, like planting native plants and, and they have the energy and activism to wanna to do it. So it's helping guide that, it's helping support it, you know, you know, Put your money to these things that need it right now. You know, the younger people need to see us, the older people, 
put a stake in the future too and say, I'm going to support this cause in a big way because if we don't do it in the next decade, we will lose that chance. Um, and then we can, you know, I so love and appreciate the energy of youth. And they, they haven't given up yet, you know, usually. In fact, they're great helping with invasive species. You know, the grown-ups get too depressed. But the kids... <laughs> you know, give them sharp tools and food and they think it's fun. Um, so we, we need each other on this and, um, and we need to make it happen faster. I think that's something that they really react to being young. You know, they think two years is a really long time. You know, let's get more of these things happening quick that can then be, you know, shown that it causes a better situation. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, questions now of uh, general towards this question or general questions down here in the front and then up in the back after that. That's all right. She's young. <laughs> Thanks. These have all been great topics. Um, my comment is going uh, actually ties in with uh, what you were discussing at first. Um, how, and it seems like this question was focused on, you know, how to get the younger generation to, to care. Uh, we, you know, Rips uh, is looking for places to collaborate. And I think collaboration, there's a lot of organizations in Rhode Island. Rhode Island is a tiny state. There's so many organizations. One of them is the Rhode Island Environmental Education Alliance, who have been working to get environmental ed into the schools K through 12. So, and they've done a lot of work on um, how to um, excite um, the school department <laughs> to want to have this done. So, this is a place where uh, RIPS can offer, you know, specific programs. Um, and so, being part of that organization. There's the Watershed Council, um, there's the, you know, Conservation Commissions, um, you know, there are all umbrella organizations for all of these things that people have talked about uh, that, you know, RIPS can be, you know, part of trying to get out their message. Um, you know, environmental education, to me, I'm a retired environmental educator, and um, a lot of it is about getting kids and people to care. It's not just providing information, it's how do we get them emotionally involved. You know, we talk about the sadness of what we're losing, but we need to get people excited about what we have right now. You know, get them out there, um, get them interested. So, um, thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, up in the back, Pat. <laughs> I'd like to sort of focus for a moment on maybe some of the populations that are going to be harder to engage. So many of us here have probably been exposed to plants and to nature growing up. Um, we had opportunities to, to uh, be in the woods. We had opportunities to learn from uh, generations ahead of us, parents or grandparents who were involved in plants. I didn't come to native plants until I was uh, near 60 because I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And I look at the conversations happening around food deserts and the challenges of engaging urban youth and supporting urban families. And I think we face that challenge with native plants as well. Now I walk through the city of Providence on a regular basis and there are a few community gardens, many just in, in empty lots that are brown fields. There, it would be great for us collectively to think how for such a large population of people who are going to inherit a world that is already challenging, how native plants can be meaningful when that meaning right now doesn't resonate uh, probably with a, a large portion of their the adult populations in a lot of these neighborhoods. So any thoughts on sort of that specific slice of 
how we get youth and how we get uh, people engaged in native plants where native plants are not even a, something that's a blip on the radar. <clears throat> Yeah, so how do we deal with the youth that don't even know what the word native plant means? Heather, do you want to say? Get them out in nature somehow, you know, which means paying for a bus and a camp counselor, probably somebody young and fun to take them out, you know, get them out of the city to experience it. And then I think demonstration plantings can be really effective way where you know in the city where people can see it or street trees but i think we need to i lived in barcelona <coughs> about 10 years ago and just being in a really big city you could see and then i didn't have a car there was no way to get out in nature and so how are these urban people going to get it if we don't get them in contact with it so provide that you know provide that opportunity I just have to add that I've spent a lot of time in Lincoln Woods with my granddaughter over the last year, and it's amazing how much use that park gets, and it has quite a bit of native plant material up there. Yeah, I would say fo focus on, on investing in parks because those are, you know, democratic spaces and free spaces. And I just also want to say something that maybe gardening remains a luxury item for many people. And that is a hard truth that we, you know, as much as we like to, you know, it, it is inaccessible for large portions of people that a don't own land or have a garden or even, uh, you know, a, a stoop to make a container garden with. Um, yet their ability to engage with nature is just as important as all of ours. And that's why we have to, I think, invest more in public spaces um, as places where, if, you know, if you don't have the street trees or the woods, you know, you're going to go to whatever park is nearby uh, and spend time. And that's the engagement point. Um, and, you know, it's not without its challenges, certainly. Um, but I think that's a, it's an obvious place um, to, to put more investment because I think the payoffs are crucial. That's, that's, I think that's a really important point, really. Um, I remember being in Portugal a number of years ago and amazed at how it seemed like every median strip every little bit of property um, between somebody's garage and the street, there was two feet of land. It was cultivated in some way, maybe flowers, maybe some vegetables, um, whatever. We have not had that ethic here, but that might be something to look more toward is using those little bits of land. I was astounded at how, how much gardening was going on in densely packed towns. So that might be something we could encourage too, just curbside, curbside gardening. Um, but again, protecting preserves is great. And as Heather mentioned, getting kids out, maybe the Wild Plant Society could sponsor a bus for a group of school children who live in the city to get out. Uh, maybe we should all go talk to the University of Rhode Island president and get them to reopen the Environmental Education Center at uh, the W. Alton Jones campus. Uh, <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I, I think to me, one of the huge important things, and we've talked about it here in many ways, talking about the focus on pollinators, we're really focusing on community, on the community that each plant has and the community that we're a part of. And um, some words from Wendell Berry come to my mind. This is Wendell Berry's farmer, Old Jack. I don't know if any of you have read The Memory of Old Jack. And Old Jack says, the way we are, we are members of each other all of us, everything. The difference ain't in who's a member and who is not, but in who knows it and who don't. How do we get everybody to understand we're all part of a community, so. Um, Dave Visso in the back. Just to bring it back to something real and urban, uh, there is uh, something with April Alex of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Urban Partnership, and they just planted, along with the uh, Providence Public Parks, uh, the Amtrak station. We planted uh, thousands of plants there. That would be a wonderful place to get people to volunteer. RIPS members did help in the planting a couple of weeks ago. It's going to need a lot of help as these native plants um, 
come up amongst the weeds in the spring, they would love to have some help. And just think about the possibilities of making that particular place flourish, to have kids in the city see the beauty of native plants. Just and, a thought. And Dave, David, can you describe better for the audience where that exactly is? That's, if you were to uh, take the Amtrak train right in Providence, it's right there. Uh, there's some beautiful, geez, it has to be uh, several garden plots that are basically in, in cement containers, if you will. But I mean, you're talking 70, 100 feet, you know, by 30, 40 feet, several of them. Uh, so it needs a lot of help. Um, and uh, this would be a great group to help, especially if you're in that particular area. It would be a wonderful place to focus on. Um, other quick down here, there's a question. And then, um, and then Susan, after you. Brian, if I might just jump in real quick. I'm sure. reminded of a, a really wonderful program that I was part of for many years in New York City which I think is a great model that could be replicated. And um, it's called Green Horizons. And it's um, a, an annual field day for sixth and seventh graders. And um, they all come to either a park or a garden. The location would rotate from year to year. And what they're exposed to uh, are uh, literally dozens of professionals in all the different green careers that you can think of. You know, whether it's a park ranger, fish and wildlife service, you know, a botanist, whatever, the, with the expressed intention of showing these kids that there are viable career paths that have to do with nature. And that, you know, because we're also fighting against a lot of distractions and, uh, and, and, you know, particularly in urban areas, you're looking at people that are like, oh, like you're a banker, you've got lots of money, you've got a fast car, like that's what I want to do. I want to do something to make money. Uh, is exactly, you know, growth for the sake of growth, if I might uh, cannibalize that one. Um, and so I think this is another important avenue in showing that, that you know, green careers are rewarding and val val viable options for people to want to get into, um, uh, aside from going to business school, getting an MBA, becoming a lawyer, or, you know, or a CEO, whatever other dreams people have that think are going to make them happy. Um, so I just want to throw that in there. Okay, question here. Yes, um, I have a comment in a similar manner to um, our having many, <clears throat> excuse me, many land trust organizations. We also have many environmental organizations all in their own little corner. And the discussion of having volunteers work on a project from volunteers from, for instance, from this organization, the Rhode Island Tree Council is in the process of establishing a volunteer database to, to go into different communities and do what they do. So it might be a notion to not, well, to, to, to cross list these, if, these pieces of information because I'm sure there's people from there who are here and vice versa, and it would enlarge the scope of not only who you have to do the work, but also the different skill sets that, that are brought to, to the project. Thank you. Um, and then Sus Susan next. Um, well, actually, Uli stole my question. I was going to uh, pick up on what Francis said. I sit on the uh, Economic Development Committee for the town of South Kingstown, and we have been trying, some of us have been trying to get um, the notion that green infrastructure is an area of um, employment for people who maybe either don't want to go to college or want to go to college but take a different route. It's a little like banging your head against the wall, but but I do think programs like that are really important. I actually, as a as a uh, the, the world banker who was referred to before, I have had the notion that I'd like to see an economy that was based on sending kids into my meadow to count the bugs. But um, I guess I'm <laughs> going to live long enough to see that. And then the final thing I wanted to say is that I don't want to hype this. Is, is Nathan Lamb here? He, he, was, he had to wait till his wife finished a workshop. But he's been running some... Um, family walks for us. And it would have been interesting to hear him describe what the problems are with those family walks. Um, 
because there are some kids who are who are engaged and there are some who aren't. But of course, that's true in any population. But I just want to say that we are we are trying to find more people to lead family walks and to lead more family walks in general because I think that is a way you give kids an experience where they get to identify something or handle something or see something and it does begin to give them a notion that this is something that's that's fun to do so thank you all for your comments thank, thank you just throw it over your shoulder paul right behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. another program we've had for nearly 30 years it's called the rhode island Advive Fund. it works with middle and high school students we work with them on forestry soils wildlife and aquatics and this year, our special topic is climate change. So this is a program that we're always looking for advisors, education, and outreach to schools. It also incorporates a lot that these students now are geared up, and a lot of them will go further in the environmental field. Great. Thank you, Paul. Any and other questions? Can I make a comment? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Following up on what Paul said, I, although Kyra might want to do this, I don't know. Um, the Rhode Island Natural History Survey every year does a bio blitz where they choose a particular piece of property and they get as many people as they can find to look at what's there, everything from lichens and mosses and fungi and beetles and birds and plants, you name it. Um, and that does engage children, and it's a wonderful way to get kids outside and doing things. So, so keep your eye on the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and the annual bio blitz. Hi, I just want to put a plug in for Kettle Pond. If you haven't been to Kettle Pond, you're really missing something. It's in Charlestown, and they're doing a lot of education for children. They have so many activities. It's a beautiful facility, and Dave Visso, of course, is behind it. And people, sometimes I work on the kiosk, and people say, well, what should I grow for native plants? Let's go take a walk. And they're all over the place, and they're labeled. And all the volunteers have been doing a wonderful, wonderful job. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to stop there. Um, but thank you so much. The, the panelists will stay around for a few minutes. If you have questions, you can come down front. Let's give them a hand for their time today. And there is cake out in the lobby, so go enjoy. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>